Behind the Bulb is a deep dive into the ideas and industries of our world. Have you ever looked at a structure and asked, whatever happened to the people that built this? What motivated those people to wake up in the morning and head off to work? No matter the occupation, these are real questions. Put simply, why do we do what we do? This season, we focus on the building industry. We know the basic principles of how things are built, but we often don't know the narratives of the people involved in building them. Lend us your ears as we unfold their journey. Whether you are a part of the building industry or not, we think you will enjoy listening to these inspiring stories. Welcome to Behind the Bulb. I'm Brendan McCartney. And I'm James Young. On this week's episode, we have Will Poitras. We talk about his first experiences in a trade working with concrete in the Pacific Northwest, where he has his initials today on sidewalks, and how today he can be found working on construction projects that are iconic to a city skyline. We talk about safety and how to lead by example. And as he quotes, there are no failures, just things to fix. He's a problem solver, and I think you'll get these ideas from this conversation. Take a listen. We're excited to have Will Poitras, fiber splicer, not a beer drinker, prefers tequila, and quite frankly, is really, really quick-witted, so I don't know if I can handle this, and quite frankly, just a damn good guy. What do we really want to know, Will? What kind of car do you drive? (laughs) A Procal work van. (laughs) Recreationally. (laughs) (laughs) A Chevy Volt. Chevy Volt. Yeah. So you're conscious of the electricity. I am. It's cheaper to cheaper to drive. Okay. It's more it's fun conscious to drive. Conscious of money, not yeah. electricity. <laughs> <laughs> is it convenient though? Because you got to plug in and all that stuff. Yeah. It is convenient. Yeah, we put a charger in our house, and uh, okay. uh, so it costs a fraction of the gas. Did you put it in yourself? The, yeah. the charger. Yeah. Licensed electrician. Yeah, I figured I was qualified. <laughs> <laughs> you get a permit. I did not. <laughs> We're doing a, a bit of a renovation and it will be included in that permit. There you, there you so go. So we'll get it inspected. After the fact. After, After the, the fact. fact. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Right. We'll, be, we'll be assured it works properly by the time it gets inspected. <laughs> if you if you could sum up what you do briefly, you know, however you may see it, like what, what, do you, what is it that you do on a day-to-day basis? Uh, well, I oversee production of uh, electrical work for ProCal Lighting. Um, Make sure everything gets built correctly on time. On time. On time. On time. Is a big part of it. <laughs> but so, but have you done, you, you, you do the work too, right? Uh, I do. At times. Yeah. Um, if you got a good crew, perhaps you don't have to. Right? Well, I'm a big fan of lead by example, right? If you show them how to, <laughs> what the example is, then they'll follow in theory. Right. Because you, you, you were once in their shoes, right? So For sure. You know, and you had that guy who didn't. Right. And you're like, I don't want to be that guy. I learned a lot about how to lead by being led. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or led incorrectly. Right, right, right. So how, uh, how many total years have you been working with electricity? Uh, I've been in construction for 21 and electrical for seven, uh, specifically in the IBW, but probably 10 or so doing electrical work. So wait, so what was the first trade? Uh, well, I had a swimming pool company, an exterior construction company for a long time, and we did a lot of electrical work. So we oversaw the electrical work there. And that translated well into going to the IBW and the and the apprenticeship and the training through there. And then been doing that for about a decade. Wow. So all these pool owners have excellent electrical work done. <laughs> and also very naive to how a pool works and functions, right? Yeah. So- <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a lot of automation, like a lot of stuff we do at ProCal, right? A lot right. of automation controls, you know, we do the high-end fancy stuff. So, you know, right. uh, people in 2020 expect to be able to run a pool by their phone right. remotely. So make sure their hot tub's warm when they get home. <laughs> Good for California. Was that in California? Yeah, obviously, yeah. Yeah, that was, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow, so, okay, so you started in pools, right? And then from there, you moved into... Uh, well, for there I went to the IBW. I actually started in uh, in uh, Walla Walla, Washington, in a small company. Uh, we poured a lot of sidewalks and and uh, a lot of public work stuff. A lot of irrigation boxes go in in Walla Walla, Washington. Have you have you always been inclined to 
working with your hands or? You yeah. Know? So I worked in construction for a really long time and then uh, I went back and got my degree. So I was going to, you know, join, be a professional and do all that. And I worked for corporate America about six months and uh, went right back to construction. So I haven't looked back since. <laughs> was there, when you, it was your first day in corporate America, was there a moment where you were like, get me out of here? Yeah, totally. <laughs> I think filling out the paperwork for eight hours was my first inclination that I was not going to like it. <laughs> Can only be offered so many cups of time, coffee to get you through a, a booklet <laughs> of, of paperwork. Which at that time is actually you were filling out the paperwork, right? Yeah, yeah. You're, literally you're my first a, day on the job. Yeah. Not on a computer, right? right? You're actually writing this out. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I was like, this is not going to work. <laughs> well, wait, what, what, what was the position? Uh, with sales. Like yeah, corporate sales. Corporate sales. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, I just miss the, in construction, you know, you go out every day and you build stuff and you can see your progress, you know, and at the end of the day, if you're building a building, you can see the building go up. If you're doing the electrical, one day you're going to turn the lights on and all the lights come on. It's just a feeling. It's uh, it's hard to get in other trades. I was talking to you about this earlier, that this concept of you're building a building. It's incredible that anything gets built uh, because any project, any high rise or TI has people involved with it that perhaps they're not as capable and they need some guidance, right? They need leadership, but yet the building or the TI still gets, comes to completion somehow and people occupy the space and we're sitting in this space right now and it's wonderful, right? It's like, yeah, oh, it's a great space, but I'm sure there are things that happen along the way. So when you entered the industry and you started seeing, seeing this, how did you interact with some of the other trades as you enter a, a, an occupy a space and you say, okay, we're going to build out the electrical ear and we're going to make sure there's uh, this conduit is running in this direction and we have this material and uh, we got to do this before these guys come in. This other trade comes right. in. How was it functioning with other trades and then interpreting the plans and that, that coordination that has kind of come by your experience? Well, I think when you first start, of course, you're very like, you know, you end up in a lot of fights, right? Like you don't see the bigger picture. You, I need this room right now and they need that room right now. And everybody, you know, as you move up the the chain, you start seeing the bigger picture and you see the full set of plans. You realize that everyone's got to work together and somehow you've got to get all these different personalities that all want to fight into one cohesive unit and get this building built. Right. And that's the trick, I think. So do you find that it's actually, it's people buying into that mindset more than it is like, one guy saying we got to do we, this needs to happen. I, I think all types of personalities, right? There's some that need that. Uh, I need to be told what to do. You need to tell them if you don't do this, you know, this will happen. There's those out there and there's those that will buy in, you know, that we're, we got to get this thing built. So we all got to work together. There's you, less of those. <laughs> do you find that it's like, um, it's not necessarily it's subcontractor, general contractor, architect, owner at the end of the day, when it comes to that, like that cohesion, the, the, the collective spirit that's required, all of that kind of goes to the wayside and there's this like, uh, you know, business aside, this is the guy that's kind of, or this is the lady that's, she's the, this, this, this is the person that's actually leading the charge and, and we're all buying into this idea. I don't know. I feel like, uh, you know, the, the, maybe on a smaller job, I think the bigger jobs, everyone's just kind of doing their own thing. You know, everyone knows that this is my job. I've got to get the plumbing into this building and I've got to get this one building done or this one floor and uh, my boss tells me I've got to get this wall done or whatever. It's just it. it's everyone in their own little microcosm doing their thing. And then eventually it all comes together. You know, you have layers of people who, you know, from the from the smallest in wall, one wall at a time to the guy that's seeing the whole over thing and it, it, the, the overall picture. And it requires all of it to work together. But I don't know if anyone at the bottom sees the top. Right. Do, do you remember a specific moment perhaps where? you were a part of a team, uh, whether you're a subcontractor, whatever the position may be, and and you identified this person has the capability of derailing this team camaraderie. Oh, for sure. <laughs> Those people are out there. <laughs> Can you some name people, a specific- some, some people really enjoy that position, you know? I mean- Can you I, name a specific time, perhaps? Uh, too many times. I don't know if I could name one. <laughs> there, there, there's so many personalities and the big and the bigger the job, you know, if you have a thousand people working on a job, you're going to have a thousand different personalities and they're right. all over the place. Why did you first show up to the trades? Was there, just, was there somebody or? Yeah, my, my, uh, 
I, w- I was in a small town and, you know, there's not a huge amount of opportunity. And my brother-in-law was making pretty good money working on a, on a project. So, you know, he invited me to come work with him and I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the, you know, see the, see your, your work transform a whole city, something that people can go look at right now. My first year, we built a lot of sidewalks around the town of Milton Freewater, Oregon. That's and uh, so people are walking on them right now. Are your initials on them? Uh, they are. Absolutely are. <laughs> That's cool. Where, where is, do you, you know the cross section of where? Oh, they, I could definitely find it. Yeah. You mentioned a uh, brother-in-law got you into it. Did you have to sign up or was it private? Was it a private company? Or it was a was small it? company. He yeah. was a uh, part of a, probably a four man crew. And uh, it was a really small company. I mean, it was, I guess they did a lot of big work, but they weren't, didn't have a lot of employees. So um, on his recommendation, they hired me sight unseen and probably regretted it for a year while I learned the trade. <laughs> Yeah, my first boss was probably 20, 30 years in. He was extremely accomplished, and he immediately recognized my lack of knowledge. It did not take him long at all to realize I was a bad hire, (laughs) and he hated working with me. So I set about immediately trying to prove him wrong, uh, which took, you know, about two years to finally learn enough to even be worth his time. Uh, So that was my motivation was just a very first, I I couldn't care about less about the work or what we were building. I just wanted to (laughs) To have him realize that I wasn't as terrible as he thought I was. So, but you you mentioned knowledge, which is interesting because yep. I I believe I've heard you say that I'll take the work ethic of an apprentice. Yeah, because they, they these their hung their hung, the hunger for knowledge in some in some cases is like in parallel with their drive to to actually work. You know, well, you can teach knowledge and you can't teach work ethic. That's the one thing you can't fix work ethic. So you either have it or you don't. Uh, you can motivate people. Certainly, you can maybe can eke out 10% here or there, but you certainly can't take someone from I don't care about my job to I love my job. I'm willing to work all this extra stuff. So, you know, yeah, I would definitely take and you, you can teach someone, you know, if you come in fresh, you know, there's benefits to knowing what you're doing. But there's also something to be said for someone who's willing to learn. You can learn it my way. You can do it the right way. Right. You haven't learned all the bad habits. Do you think that applies to corporate America? I'm sure it applies to everything. Everything, yeah, it does. There's a place for knowledge where there's no replacement for it, where simply, especially in the electrical trade, there's a lot of stuff we do where, you know, simply you could kill people if you don't know what you're doing, right? So there's a place for knowledge and there's a place for just eager enthusiasm. (laughs) It takes all kinds. I sense um, you meant the safety of the work environment, particularly with electricity, is a major factor. Um, I suppose there's been instances where you've come across a work environment that is of uh, higher danger. So there's, you know, there's a, perhaps a higher pay associated with it, right? Because of the circumstances. But you also, you know, you take the proper protocols that have been educated within the electrical field to make sure that you're taking the right precautions. Um, but even then, you take the right precautions and everything that's been instructed in that is all in human knowledge that this is what we should do. And there you are in the moment. And it's, there's a 1.2 kV. There's, there's the thousands of volts running through mm-hmm. this line here and I've got to splice it or whatever. You know, I got to work. Through. Yeah. So, we, so we, I think the beauty of working for the union is that's just built into the job. It's built into our contract. We engineer things to be safe. We, we do it correctly. And if we can't do it safely, we'll keep looking at it until we can do it safely. So I actually haven't in the union done anything that's unsafe that wasn't of someone's own choice, right? Like I, at any point we all have the power to say that's not safe. And that's a great feeling because sometimes you're like, well, maybe there's a little bit of inherent, uh, you know, uh, unsafety built into this. I'm willing to take that risk. But for the most part, if something's really dangerous, you can engineer it out. There's nothing we do that you can't, I can't shut it down upstream or, you know, I can, I can, I can fix the problem so that it is under my threshold for safety. Right. And that's great. I think, cause a lot of, uh, you know, I, I, I see a lot of non-union trades or, you know, some are, some aren't, but or a lot of other companies where they're just more interested in productivity than they are safety. And at the end of the day, I could care less if I don't live. Right. It doesn't do me any good. Yeah. I think I've heard you say that specifically on site before, which has been fantastic, you know, because that, that representation well, came about in the, the 1920s or thir- uh, 1930s, right? Specifically from another aspect of um, 
American business, but has now attributed itself to other uh, parts, particularly construction, has quite frankly saved lives. You might have a journeyman on site, and if there there wasn't this type of uh, instruction, then perhaps they would be doing uh, shoddy work. Then you have an apprentice comes in who knows no better, assumes that their superior has functionally, you know, done a specific splice, and you know that oh the line's not high right now. That you know the breaker's off, you know, and then they go in. And, Unfortunately, that's, you know. that's exactly right. And I feel like with if you set up your system such that uh, it, I would feel uncomfortable as a journeyman talking to you as a journeyman about something unsafe, then you've created a good system, right? Like where where it's uncomfortable if someone brings up doing something unsafely because it's not the norm, right? Where it used to be absolutely they would factor in we're going to lose 102 employees on this job, right? They're going to die. And now that's unacceptable. Zero is the correct number. And that has to be engineered in. And then if my my foreman is telling me to do something that's unsafe or I recognize as unsafe, then there's a whole system. I have people I can talk to and it would be weird if I didn't exercise those rights. So that's a that's a big difference in the last you know 100 years. <clears throat> this is why I thought you were being way too modest on your elevator speech at the beginning. I mean, you had brought up like two points of what you do, but I know you have a lot of concern on your mind about these kind of safety factors and what goes on on a daily basis on the job site. That's a huge burden. It is. I mean, yeah, people die. <laughs> people die, unfortunately, uh, yearly, right? People in my reunion die every year. So, yeah, it's on your mind. I mean, you don't want that. That would be a career wrecker. And additionally, like, how would I deal with that emotionally the rest mm-hmm. of my life? You were you were on our project where we were in the middle of I-5, in the yeah. middle of the freeway. Yeah. And uh, you've got a company that we've contracted to secure the highway. We've got Border Patrol securing lanes with their cars. And still, occasionally, some drunk guy plows through all your cones and goes right to your construction site. Like, that's nothing you can control, right? Like, so you engineer everything you can out of the situation, and you're still left with sometimes people don't do what they're supposed to do. Yeah, yeah so then it, 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 we were... Th- talking about this earlier too is uh the construction of a building and the concept of a human life in the construction of the building has changed and we're experiencing perhaps the third generation of that where uh, all of the instance of zero uh casualties right Right. or fatalities unfortunately um and it still happens and it's like it's it's deep it's sad it's very sad you know and uh these unions have been put in place to ensure right the safety and sec- safety of the uh the worker and to me i you know i think of it and it's incredible that uh, there's these entities in place now to to make sure that we protect the worker it, when we ask the question how is a building built well you got the owner you got the designer, the architect. A lot, a lot of work goes into the actual implementation, and then you got the engineering. And so you have a lot of numbers, you have a lot of lines, you have a lot of instruction. The building plans, right? This, these should be a a collection of papers that tell you how to build this building. And the contractor has an understanding of how to interpret those plans. But what if the the written language is not what it's it's it perhaps there's a typo, or perhaps there's, it happens. Yeah, that or it's or it's written in a language that is not discernible, right? Or they're communicating one thing, but it's not traditional. And so insert the contractor, and they are now having to interpret these plans and make a decision based off the schedule that they have already provided, right? So they've said, all right, we're going to build this building in a year and a half. And uh, I'm looking through the construction plans here and uh, I see a lot of variables that are of concern. We need these addressed. Now, suddenly we're adding hours to the engineer. We're adding out, you know, the owner sees all of this and they're, why are we adding hours? Well, I'm telling you right now, this is, we need to get this addressed. Perhaps the owner needs to now pay a little bit more because they have hours associated with the architect and the engineer. That whole process is incredibly complex. So now you have the contractor having to dance that the politics, right? And they're trying to think, all right, well, I can make up time here. Now it comes the time game. 
and now the contractor playing the time game. Was there a moment in time when you were dealing, you, you first experienced that, you know, the time, the interpretation of drawings, and you thought, you started having these like meta thoughts about this system of constructing a building? Uh, I did have a bit of a, a moment. We were building a, a hospital, uh, a wood, a, a simple wood framed uh, one story with a very complex roof system. Uh, there was multiple roofs coming in from different directions. It was really complicated and the plans were very unspecific. And my foreman and I at the time were, we just finished up this, this one very complicated section of framing and we were standing back looking at it to make sure we got it right. And the architect standing had come up behind us and was like, Oh, I was wondering how you guys were going to do that. And it was such a moment of like, you would have saved so much money if, if the architect had done his job correctly and designed this correctly versus uh, me and my foreman spending weeks designing this on in the field, you know, the, the, the guys in the field should be doing, not thinking um, the plans. So yeah, the disconnect sometimes between engineering and, and building uh, in, in an ideal world, I think the engineer speaks the language of the builder and the builder speaks the language of the engineer, but sometimes that's, there's a disconnect <laughs> <laughs> and it's expensive. Yeah. A uh, bigger project, the more expensive it gets. M- small mistakes can broadcast out uh, a simple change you move a pipe over, uh, you move an air conditioner over. Now everything in the room has to be re-engineered. Uh, yeah. Now we've got to get the lighting guy back out here. Our sensors don't work next to this duct. All these things can come in. So, you know, you, I, I think the engineers spend as much time as they can, but they're, of course, like us, trying to save money and get get the product out as quickly as possible. But And I think a lot of jobs go wrong. I remember as an apprentice seeing like a lot of like churn on a job, right, where they bring in guys to do one little phase and then the next they get rid of those guys, send them somewhere else and then bring in other guys. And so you don't get that like accomplishment. Like I put in all this pipe and wire and now these lights come on. Right. And I think that's a failure in management because I think to be honest, like if you've worked on a project for a year and a half, sometimes you ran the underground to watch the building come up and then you started putting the, the backbone in. And then after a year and a half or two years of working, they throw that switch and everyone's heart is just stops for a second and the lights come on, right? That's a great feeling. And I'm sure it's the same for the plumbers and uh, the structural guys when they put that last beam on, you know, seeing that from beginning to end, um, I think that's worth something to keep guys on a job long enough to see the the product of their labor, you know? How fleeting is that moment? Because uh, you're off to the next job the next day. Yeah, right? it could happen. Yeah, for sure. But the, but, uh, the commissioning part of a, of a big building is going to take a long time. So you're going to see the progress of like we turn on the first floor this week and then we're going to test it and go through everything. But then next week we're going to throw on another floor. And even I, th- I think even the other trades for the electricians, it's it's super obvious because the lights come on. Right. And the, so I think the other trades see, you know, they probably know we're all on edge. Second floor switch gets thrown. Lights come on. Everyone's like, oh. <laughs> I was just gonna say we did it. it floor twelve, lights not going on. Yeah, or it, and it does out, happen that way too. Bring out the uh, commissioning agent, right? They right. come out and it's like uh, you were supposed to put the controller over here. <laughs> what? Right. There's a little bit of that, but it's a it's largely right. a, a bunch of successes punctuated by a few failures. Right. But right. they're never failures. They're just things to fix. Right. Excellent way to put it. Right there. They're never failures. They're things to fix. They're yeah, I like that. That's the way a building's built. Right. And we're, you and can we're troubleshoot. Fixers. You can troubleshoot anything, right? And, right. and make it work. Right. Uh, that's the one most intriguing thing about uh, the electrical contracting trade to me that I've experienced so far is the the way that these uh, electricians troubleshoot. It's, like, it's a daily thing. It's just something that just never stops. You, you can plan, you can plan, you can plan, but no matter what, you cannot expect every single problem that's going to arise. But every time I've been out to take pictures or something like that, I've always like been like so fascinated with this, this, uh, this troubleshooting process. It just happens constantly. Right. You know? Well, it's, you know, I, I think electrical is a little bit different in that if you install a bunch of plumbing and it's got a leak, right? You can see exactly where the leak is. Uh, electrical has leaks too, but no one knows where they're at. Right. They could happen anywhere from the top of the building to the bottom of the building and no one knows where they're at. So there's a series of steps you go through, I think, and, and it helps you learn the process. You know, I think the more I've I've troubleshot and the more I've had the the, the luck to work on crews that look for problems is you learn more about how electricity works and, and how it all ties together. Because every time you solve a problem, you learn how to not commit that problem again. So that's good. 
like there's a moment in time when you're sh- troubleshooting where you continuously try the same thing over and over again. And you might do it 10 times thinking, ah, it's got to be this. You do it again. No, 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 it's not that. Ah, let me try it again. I, I, I used to do that all the time. But then I got to the world of electricity. And it's like, you did it once. It doesn't work. That, That's it. Stop. That's it. <laughs> it doesn't work. Yeah. Well, with electrical too, uh, it could work one day and then not work the next. So if it doesn't work one way, you absolutely need to rule that system out because <laughs> yeah. that's a bad system. 20 years later, or 10, 10 days later, it might do trip again. You, you don't want that. So you got to fix the problem. I think, I think too, with experience, you learn, like I've troubleshot this situation so many times that it's a 80% chance of this situation. And if that doesn't work, then we've got maybe a 60% chance it's this. And you just kind of work your way down your list. Right. Right. You learn where to look ultimately right so you were brought into the to a trade with sidewalks found your way into pools at some point one you were like i gotta get educated then you got into the corporate room i were like screw this not for me and then you got into the ibw and the union electrical union and here, I mean, now, and now you're at a standpoint where you have all this experience. You you've installed uh, lighting upgrades in school districts, um, at uh, high profile, like border uh, border patrol, the California border patrol. You've been down there um, with actually helping the LED upgrades there for their lighting. Is it this the satisfaction that, that drives you? Uh, I think it is. I mean, it certainly kept me going this long. You know, you. you yeah, it's been great in the IBW because we work on higher profile things. We see, build buildings that you can see from the freeway. And I never had that working in residential. And it's great. You know, you build a 27 story building that's the courthouse and everyone downtown is talking about it. If I walked into a bar and any in downtown and said, I worked on that project, they would know about it because it the whole block was blocked off and everyone was talking about it. You know, that's that's great. It's great to work on it and, uh, you know, know all the ins and outs of how it was built and. At the end of the day, people don't care, but they listen to the stories. <laughs> There's a certain hum- humility that comes along with construction. And when I say construction, I almost, in a, in a, there's like the construction of the building and there's the design of the building and there's the funding and the financials of the building. Um, that humility, um, it definitely is comprised in each segment of that building, right? But... Um, it's often filled with, uh, I think, the same individuals that might show up to the job site from a contractor and be like, "I'm just gonna, I'm getting my paycheck. I gotta, I have a newborn on the way. I just, I'm just gotta collect my money. I'm here for the overtime, right? It, the same person, the same ideology might exist for the the lighting designer or the uh, architect. It's like I'm here to just put my hours in and put this graphic together. I don't truly care about the construction of the building. That concept of make doing good work did that just come from your own uh impetus or where where did that come from like it was the reserve of like doing good work I guess that, my dad for sure yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 from a from an early age definitely yeah. to give him uh you know 40 50 hours work for 40 hours pay was my dad's yeah. always yeah. I was statement. Um, but I, th- I think just, ag- again, the reward, you know, if you do a great job, you know, you're, you're recognized in your field, you can see quality right. work. Um, to me, that's more rewarding than just showing up and getting a, a paycheck for installing some shoddy work and right. doing a crummy job. Right. Um, it's just worked out better for me. Do you read? Uh, I read a lot of uh, information, but I don't read books. Newspaper. I don't read a lot. I read Articles. a lot of non- nonfiction. I don't read a lot of fiction. Okay. If that makes a difference. So you read different articles, things going on in the world. Yeah, papers, they? articles, stuff like that. Scientific papers? Yeah, I'm pretty interested in that stuff, even though I'm not good at it. Oh, for real? Okay. Yeah. Uh, specific about electrical or anything? No, no, I not really. That's not that interesting. I mean, yeah, this guy does electrical <laughs> do all day. Why, why would you want to go home and read? Yeah, about I think I'm pretty pretty well versed in electrical. <laughs> there's some people, man, they just they are all about it, man. Yeah, no, I, th- I think there's a lot of fascinating stuff in the world, you know. And I can read an article and not understand any of the math and get the overview, and I think it's super fascinating, you know, the the stuff that humans come up with, you know, and right. study and and figure out. Do you think this generation of humans is the smartest generation of humans? Oh, by far. Yeah, they have access to more information than we ever did. You know, I, I just even think of the simple thing about driving to to this place I've never been, right? I, I just 
tell Google, I don't even have to type it in. I just tell Google, take me to the studio. And it knows exactly what I'm talking about. You know, I, we had map books when I was uh, an adult. And before that, we had nothing. Yeah, you know, as a kid, Thomas we had nothing. Guide. Yeah, the Thomas Guide was something that was developed later in my life. Yeah, that was high tech. <laughs> that was high tech. And now a kid, you know, uh, my girlfriend will say otherwise. But I think the Google is amazing that you could fact check someone in seconds. She likes to loudly proclaim these ridiculous statements. And in two seconds, you know, we could find out if she's right or not. And it's definitely changed the entire tone of our relationship. <laughs> I will how, yeah. <laughs> well, how do you how do you feel about when you're at a party or you're with a so in a social gathering and someone spouts some facts and you're like, "Thanks, I could have found that out of Google in two yeah, seconds, yeah. and now I'm going to check you." Yeah. <laughs> well, they give me something to check, right? Like, oh, that's an interesting thing. I should look that up. Yeah, you're probably wrong, but I could look that up. <laughs> yeah. And it's distracting to be wrong now because, yeah. like, oh, they're that's cute. They're trying to be correct. It seems to be encouraged. <laughs> And so there's like the idea, the idea of truth is uh, a little, it's accepted to be wrong at this point. Yeah. It's like, well, we all have this technology in our pocket. We could all check each other. What this person's saying sounds like false and we could all check them, but you know what? Eh, you know, we're in the moment. <laughs> well, the very nature of the internet too is unregulated, right? Like that's the right. beauty of it. But also like if I have an opinion, no matter what it is, the chupacabra is real. There's evidence on the internet of that. Correct. Well, how many times have you used Google on a job to figure something out? An embarrassing amount, yeah. <laughs> Everybody, you, yeah. You watch this. But you know, you know, Google's really getting pretty powerful. If I type in what's the the multiplier for a thirty degree bend, it doesn't even take me to a web page. It literally says as uh, right below my question the answer, which is pretty amazing. So I could put my phone away before anyone saw what happened. <laughs> got to use the technology. Right? You got to use your technology, yeah. right? A smart person knows how to use technology to their advantage. Right. There you go. Well, it's like the, you know, the caveman knew how to make fire. Yeah. We might have his blood in our blood right now. <laughs> the I'm first guy sure. that looked up how to make a fire on Google looked pretty stupid to his companions, but you know, as soon as it got going, he looked pretty smart. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 15 years ago or today or today. <laughs> right. Yeah. And it was fascinating. Uh, the tools, right? So, I, w I was reading a collection of books about, uh, it's a fiction books, but they were talking about the construction of, uh, of cathedrals in the medieval times. And the, one of the main characters carries his tools with him. He's a builder. And his tools are the most vital part of his existence almost because it's like if for the surviving of him and his family is based off of his tools and the quality of his tools. When... Did you learn a value about the quality of tools and like these are because it's very apparent these are my tools. Is is that something you learned at a young age from your dad or? Um, for sure. I mean, he always had great tools and like you're only as good as your tools, right? Like if you have the right tools, a job will be done correctly. It will be done quickly. It will be done efficiently. If you have the wrong tools, it probably won't turn out as well. It will take longer, right? So you can see that when you start working on things, and then to uh, in the trade. You know, as you're as you're younger and getting into the trade, people are going to tell you very obviously, like, don't make these mistakes <laughs> that you you what you save on buying a cheap tool is going to cost you money by replacing it 15 times. All right. So, yeah, I mean, we're only as good as our tools. If you have a good set of tools, you're extremely valuable to a company. You're extremely valuable to a project. All right. I can remember with my 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 dad, uh, the sewer would get clogged from my brother because too much toilet paper or something, you know, and he get pissed off and he has to go rent some machine from down the street. And then we're out there at the line, just doing the snake up and down the freaking pipe, you know, and my dad's see, Hey, get me this, get me that. You know, I, I can remember being in the wings, you know, like the, the old, old fudge moment, you know, of a Christmas story. It's the, I, did you have those types of moments where you were the guy waiting in the wings, supplying the tool or t for your dad or <laughs> he, my dad always had the tools. I'd never had anything that he didn't have. I no, inherited I mean, all well, his tools. Uh, the runner. Let me see. The runner. The runner. Yeah. For the, Oh, tool. for sure. For sure. Yeah. My dad Weren't wasn't, always, my dad was not as good as he thought he was at, at fixing anything, but he was enthusiastic. <laughs> I always felt good. Like when I would, when my dad would like request a certain tool and I'd bring it the right one. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> It's like, well, yes. Well, I could never contribute in any other way at the age of 10, right? Like it was either go get this tool and then maybe bring the right one. He certainly wasn't going to tell me fix this problem. Right. I certainly couldn't fix the problem. So, 
There was at that moment when I was a younger, I can remember specifically neighbors would come by, right? And this concept of guys watching other guys do work, you know, and talk about the problem or something, or afterwards with a beer or something, and be like, hey, you have any ideas on this? I realized very quickly that my dad got all of his ideas from our neighbors. <laughs> When I got older, but when yeah. I was younger, I was like, man, my dad really knows what he's doing. He's a genius. <laughs> <laughs> so there's been kind of a community of it knowledge is. that kind of just weaves its way together when it comes to, you know, commercial construction, yes, but also residential. Yeah. I think construction in general, people share, I mean, just human nature in general, you share tips and tricks, right? Like it's just the way we are, right? Oh, I was working on this project. Oh, I was working on the same thing. We did it this way. Oh, we did it this way, you know, and that's, you know, you hear enough of those things. You like, you kind of, you take your, the best of the best and you put it together and, uh, you know, it helps. So do you have brothers and sisters? I do. Were they also as enthusiastic with construction or? Not even remotely. My brother worked for my company for a little while and hated it. Uh, so. He's a, he's a currently a firefighter and my sister is a teacher. So my whole family's teachers. Um, I'm one of the only, my brother and I are the only ones that weren't, aren't teachers, no matter how far back in my family you go. <laughs> but it, it's clear you enjoy educating the apprentices on site. Yeah. Well, they're the ones going to pay for my retirement. So <laughs> we got to make sure they know what they're doing. Yeah. It's like, uh, you know, you're with your kids. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you got to take care of your kids. Yeah. Because they're taking care of you. They're going to take care of you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So in construction for 20 plus years, do you still see yourself retiring in construction? Yeah, I think so. I mean, as I get older, I probably want to be more in a management position and less in a doing position as, uh, you know, the years go on. But I, I really like it. You know, even from a management position, it's nice to see, you know, even more so from a management position in a lot of ways, because you're overseeing more people and more production. And so instead of maybe on the, on the, the, the individual worker side, you see a certain segment of a, of a building go up, but from a management position, you see the entire building go up and it's in many ways more rewarding, I think. So I, I can see myself kind of just moving on that path as, as my body gets less and less helpful <laughs> to a, production. That's the goal for all of us, right? Right. Use our mind, use our mind more as yeah. my body gives out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But you, so you owned your own business. I did. Do you miss it? Uh, you know, I miss, uh, no, not even really. <laughs> I don't miss the, uh, 20 hour days. People calling me at two in the morning. My pool pump doesn't work. I don't care. <laughs> Call me at 6am like a normal person. And that's actually it. We had to cut it short because it went for such a long time in speaking with Will. Yeah, I, I uh, tended to ramble a little bit there and we got into some content about how cool Will was when he goes out in public and how everyone approaches him. And we could have talked probably for the rest of the night. We do have that extra content. So if somebody actually wants to hear the rest of what Will has to say, uh, please uh, message us. Thank you for your time. Thanks for listening. And if you could, please subscribe, share with your family and friends. Here's a sneak peek into next week's episode. Good afternoon. Dan, how's it going? Um, it's going fine. It's going fine. How are you guys? We're doing or well. Are you, uh, is it just you? It's Brandon? just myself. Uh, yeah, we and we, we're not recording yet, but uh, it's just myself. And now I've got James Young here. How are you doing, Dan? Oh, okay, great. Hi, James. Thank you for putting up with me on the uh, release. Sorry. Oh, not Being, a problem. Sorry to be such a pain. No, that was, you weren't a pain at all. Yeah, James made a comment. He said, uh, it's good to know that people read these things. Yeah, it took me two goes. But yeah, um, <laughs> there's, certain, there's certain phrases that just sort of catch my attention. But at any rate, I'm glad we're through that. I got the questions um, that you sent the first time as well as your follow-ons. That sounds like fun. Yeah, yeah. It's just driving at, um, you know, talking about inspirations and, and the story and... and um, we find that you know, professionals today and people who are perhaps out of college could, could benefit from hearing about it. This podcast has been sponsored by ProCal Lighting.